Kiora tinakoru 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 kato e nui ana a iho ki a nui hoki te fakamaomiti ki a ia. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Coming to you in Tereo, in the national language of the Maori Indigenous people of New Zealand. Thank you for those words, Russ. I'm glad you didn't say too many other things. Um, but it's a privilege to be with you, and we're looking forward to being able to share uh, the topics that are before us um, <clears throat> today. I want to open this morning by reading a, a passage from Romans. Um, I guess many of us here have taught through Romans, some of us many, many times, and I wonder how many of you ever actually get to the climax of Romans. Most of us, you know, get to maybe to the end of chapter, um, well, five or uh, six around there, and uh, we've spent so much time in the early chapters, we don't always get further. Some of us get to the end of chapter eight and the glorious climax there, and a few get as far as chapter 12, verse one, um, but Paul didn't actually stop there. His climax comes in chapter 15, and his final paragraph of his teaching, before he goes on to the final personal biographical comments about what he's doing, his final paragraph in chapter 15 says this, Accept one another then, or therefore, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews, literally the circumcision, on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed and moreover that the peoples of other cultures, Gentiles, might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. And then he quotes from each of the sections of the Old Testament about how they had all promised that God had chosen Israel so that the other nations could be blessed by God. And that's the climax of what Romans is all about. That God came in Christ so that through one culture, all cultures could come to glorify God. Now you all knew that, that every time you preach through Romans you always come to that climax, don't you? Mm. Yes, um, you will in the future of course. We'll come back to that as we go on, but it's a very significant passage. Our theme as you know from the paper is what do we mean this morning? Our theme is what do we mean? Contextualise the gospel. Like many aspects of Christian experience, we cannot choose whether or not we will contextualise. We can only choose whether we'll do so well or poorly. We're so much part of our culture and our world, and contextualisation is so much part of living as Christians in our culture for the sake of our world, that we're constantly involved in the contextualised process the problem is we just don't realise it. Well, what is contextualisation? I want to give a definition, and don't be worried, we'll unpack it as we go. The way I'm going to explain it, I'm saying contextualisation, what we mean by that is that in contextualisation, we go, with all our culturally acquired assumptions, experience and agenda, to the scriptures, with their different cultural background, presuppositions and priorities, we hear the same living message that God intended for the first readers so that then we can go in our own or to another cultural setting to people who hold yet another list of cultural expectations and <clears throat> we can explain the biblical message so that they receive it with the same impact as it held for the first readers. You want me to read it again, or I'll put it in slightly different words? Contextualization is the task of representing in a new cultural context the message of God so that it speaks the same message as originally given in the biblical context, but involves that movement that's often called moving between three horizons, where we go with our cultural presuppositions to the scripture, we listen to the scriptures which were written in another cultural within another cultural horizon, we hear the word hopefully with the same meaning as it was originally given, and then we step from there into yet a third culture, whether it's in our own country or another, 
and we start to share what we've learnt through that, that dual process to start with in yet a third cultural setting. And the process of getting it right, of relating the scriptures into that other culture, even though we've come with our cultural understanding to understand it, is the process of contextualization. That involves all these things which are listed there. Understanding the scriptures properly, exegesis, interpreting them properly, hermeneutics, translation and explanation, the whole communication process, and application. And we can use the ugly words indigenization or enculturation if you like. Now, this contextualization is bringing together all those processes and making them work so that the people who we speak to hear the message of God in the way that God intended when he first spoke it through the apostles and prophets. I want to make one or two, I hope quick, um, conditional statements. The first is that... Sorry. I'll get through all that. I want to be, I am presenting an evangelical approach to contextualization and I want to distinguish it from some other approaches. Um, probably better that I read things here so I don't go too far astray. The paper presents an explicitly evangelical approach to contextualization. We see the task as primarily relating the authoritative message of the Christian gospel and scriptures into the thought forms and lifestyles of people within their own cultural settings, taking their culture seriously in the process. We, we take the authority of scripture as God's revelation to all humanity as the essential starting point for the contextualization process. Other approaches, notably Catholic and some mainline Protestant approaches, start with the cultural realities as they are and give them more or equally important authority as sources of truth. They give the scriptures only relative authority alongside culture, church tradition, human reason and experience in the social sciences, etc., which potentially may carry equal authority as sources for the contextualization process. Now, I am not presenting or talking about contextualization in that sense. I'm taking the scriptures as the essential starting point, and I believe that the scripture is therefore um, at the scriptures and therefore scriptural translation must be an essential part of all models or approaches to contextualization, not just one option we can choose or ignore. Now I'm going to do a sidetrack because many of you will know what I'm talking about. Uh, others I want to perhaps bring along if you're not sure. Probably the most popularly used introduction to contextualization these days is Stephen Bevan's um, very helpful, and I'll stress that, book on models of contextualization. He lists in his second edition six models of, of ways of going about uh, contextualization, which he calls the translation model, the anthropological model, the praxis model, a synthetic model, transcendental, and then he added the last one after having published the book and realizing he'd left a whole strand of thought out, the countercultural model. Now, I'm not happy about that because what Bevins does is he treats all sources of revelation as of equal authority. Whether it's church tradition or the local cultural practices, they are of equal importance for contextualization as the Bible itself. And he fails to appreciate the essential place of translation of the scriptures and the authority of scripture within any of those models. All of the models have valuable things to contribute, but unless the scriptures and therefore the translation of the scriptures into understandable languages are at the heart of the models, they're immediately potentially going astray. And so I want to stress that clearly. Um, there's some information in the footnotes of the paper you'll get um, after the presentation that you may want to come back to or discuss. But for those who know what I'm talking about, that I hope that might be helpful. You can ask questions on it later if you want. So, an evangelical approach to contextualization, and when I'm talking about culture, I'm using the kind of definition that um, Paul Hebert made popular. Culture, as we're using the term, is an integrated system of beliefs, of values, of customs, and of institutions which express those beliefs, values, and customs, 
Culture binds a society together and gives it a sense of identity, dignity, security and continuity. So with those ideas behind us, why bother about contextualization? Well, my introductory response or simple answer to that is the nature of God's way of providing salvation demands it. When God chose to save the world, he contextualized his message in Christ becoming incarnate. God himself broke into a new culture, a new context, and he expects us to follow this, the same pattern. We can't do the same thing because we are not God, but we can follow the pattern. And I spell that out in the notes that you'll get later. What I want to do is to offer some key principles of contextualization. I'm not offering you yet another model, um, but I hope the things I say would in fact apply to any of the models that you might choose, um, and I would want to suggest they apply to all of them. What I'm going to say will be in three sections. First, talking about the importance of grasping the cultural factors in contextualization. Secondly, upholding the biblical truth factors in contextualization. And thirdly, seeking and finding, hopefully, the appropriate interplay between these two factors in the contextualization process. So, first of all, grasping the cultural factors and contextualizing. The first thing I want to say is that Christians accept and respect cultures as part of God's original intention for humans. I want to repeat that because not all evangelicals actually agree on that. Partly because as evangelicals we think often that the Bible begins in chapter 3 of Genesis. And for important reasons. But I want to suggest if we want to understand contextualization properly, we need to start in chapter 1 of Genesis. And when we do that, we find that we can trace God's intentions for cultures right back to chapters 1 and 2. So we need to look at those a little carefully. First, the scriptures trace the source, I want to suggest, to God himself, the source of cultures and the beginning of cultures right back to humans and to their creation. First of all, or two main ways in which I want to support that, because we were made in the image of God, the very things that make us distinctive from animals and other creatures are all culture-producing capacities. The fact that we can think, speak, relate, argue, feel for others, make choices, decide to reject and disobey. All of these factors, the fact that we're capable of creating and making new things, the fact that we are capable of developing systems of social relationships, are all capacities because we're made in the image of God. And so therefore, potentially, they are good and in fact, they are part of the very glory that belongs with being human. Now, it would be really sad, wouldn't it, if we continued to take that which is in fact the inherent glory of being made in the image of God and say, no, 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 it's all bad. Secondly, God's original commands to humans, the ones in chapter 1 of Genesis, are all culture-demanding commands. In fact, we often call them the cultural mandate God gave at the beginning. You know what I'm meaning? Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 on. You know what it says. Let's just remember, remind ourselves of, of what's there. Encapsulated in these commands, our responsibility first for family and societal life. The command was, be fruitful and multiply, which meant creating families and all the things that go with that. Family life and how we relate in family life is a cultural activity. Caring for children, rearing children, all the customs and the way we go about it are cultural activities. It goes on. It says that <coughs> we're responsible for exploring, understanding and mastering, developing, utilising and serving the resources of the universe as a trust from God for the good of our fellow humans. We're to fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it, God says, I give it to you, work it and take care of it, give names. 
These are the very substance of chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis, and all of them are commands to create culture. More than that, they give a responsibility for accountable evaluation and choice in both the moral and spiritual realms. You are free to eat, but you must not eat. You know what I'm referring to? These responsibilities are fulfilled in and through our culture-producing behaviours. These cultural capacities and God's original intention for them antedate the fall. They were there before the fall. In fact, Genesis 1.31 says it's precisely having given the commands, God then says, this is what was very good. This is God's good and perfect desire for humanity, that they be involved in producing cultures. Now, this gives a huge honour and dignity to culture because it's the way we express what God made us to be in his image and what God originally intended us to do to glorify him. So we can have, and we ought to have as Christians, the highest possible respect and appreciation of culture if we actually take the first two chapters of Genesis seriously. Now, I hope I can assume that everybody does that and we can go straight ahead from there. Hmm? We'll see. Secondly, of course, God oversees the historical development of cultures and, in fact, of the cultures of all nations. Um, we all know Acts chapter 17, Paul's words on Mars Hill, where he said how God had controlled the movements of cultures, he'd controlled the um, places where people had settled, he controlled the times and the periods for which different cultures were more significant in, in, internationally and in the biblical picture is that God's in control of all of those international affairs and all the way different cultures and different nations express their cultures. God is overseeing them all. And as you know, in Jeremiah chapter 12, I expect you all know this passage well, it tells us quite clearly, here are the words, As for all my wicked neighbours who seize the inheritance I gave my people Israel, I will uproot them from their lands and I will uproot the house of Judah from among them. But after I uproot them, I will again have compassion and will bring each of them, the surrounding nations, back to their own inheritance and their own country. And if they learn well the sayings of my people and swear by my name, as surely as the Lord lives, even so, then they will come amongst my people. Their inheritance and their countries. God appointed the inheritance and countries of all the non-Jewish, non-Hebrew nations, just as much as he did of the nations. We often in our preaching say, God only gave one land to one nation. That's not true, according to the Bible. He gave each land to each nation. And God's superintendence of the history of humanity shows that he cares about their cultures and how they work it out. Thirdly, God honours human cultures in a very special way by coming in person to live amongst them in the person of his son. When God chose to reveal himself in history, he confirmed the importance of human cultures for eternity. He didn't shout his message from the distance by some intergalactic boom. He came in person in an, in an ordinary human setting born of woman, born under the law, as Galatians puts it. Thereby, he gave dignity and value to our human scene, to our human cultures. Moreover, Jesus Christ tied proper understanding of his salvation to the particular culture in which he was born, that of a Jewish woman living under that Jewish law. Salvation is of the Jews, he told the Samaritan woman. Its salvation history is made normative and authoritative for defining all valid salvation experience. There is no other name given under heaven amongst men by which you can be saved. There was something special about God coming into the world, obviously, but he came into a particular culture into the world. He didn't come generally to mankind. He came to a particular group of people. He then offered a transformation to that people and said, and now you're responsible to share it with every other culture in turn. This was his plan and his purpose, and by that plan and purpose, he gave huge dignity to human cultures. God's purpose is to enable all cultures to be transformed and to flourish in Christ. In that passage that we read in, in Romans, in Ephesians, it tells us that this is the great mystery that the New Testament disciples found so hard to grasp, that God cared about other people. 
that God didn't just want to bless his people for their sakes, he wanted to bless them in the sense of them becoming a blessing to others, and that the mystery previously hidden before the coming of Christ was now gloriously open, that Christ among you, people of Colossae, Christ among you, people of other places, this is the hope of glory. This is the wonder of God's great final plan. God working in and through um, other cultures. His intention was that they would begin to share in the transformation and the flourishing that's only possible in Christ. We can go further. In Christ, each gospel receiving culture's life and heritage is purified and fulfilled. In that verse I just quoted from Colossians chapter 1, 27, it tells us clearly that when Christ comes into a culture, he comes to give a hope for glory. He comes to turn them around so that within their culture they can begin to look forward to fulfilment in him. So much so that by the time you get to Revelation 22 and 24, it tells us that the kings of each nation will bring from their glory to contribute to the glory of the new heaven and the new earth. I wonder what is the glory that you from... Where do we start? From Suriname or from um, Australia. What glory could they possibly contribute to God's glory? Um, or from... Good sense of humour. Oh, right, okay. Um, will you get the point? What is it that is distinctive about your culture, your nation? The scripture says you're going to contribute into the great glory. There's no need for a sun, moon or anything else because God will be the, the light and yet that light's going to be enriched by the glory that comes from every nation. Now that's an amazing reality. And I hope we're all thinking it through and making sure that our people so value their culture that they've got their presentation to bring, whether it's their dancing or their music or their singing or other aspects of their creativity. I don't know, but boy, it's going to be wonderful to share in it. And now, it's easy to forget that this, this is what God's looking for. Certainly, um, it will mean purifying that culture first and fulfilling it in Christ but that's precisely what Christ came to do. He transforms each culture he invades, he reproduces the pattern of the incarnation. Andrew Walls, my professor, and I'm going to quote him a number of times this morning, forgive me. When God became man, he says, when God became man, Christ took flesh in a particular family, members of a particular nation with the tradition of customs associated with that nation. All that was not evil, he sanctified whether he, wherever he's taken by humans in any time and place, he takes that nationality, that society, that culture and sanctifies all that is capable of sanctification by his presence. Not that that takes place easily. That society never exists, Andrew goes on to say, in East or West, ancient times or modern, which could absorb the word of Christ painlessly into its system. Jesus within Jewish culture, Paul within Hellenistic culture, take it for granted that there will be rubs and frictions, not from the adoption of a new culture, but from the transformation of the mind towards that of Christ's. Developing this refined cultural mind, purifying our cultures, turning our understandings and that which makes us part of our own culture to become conformed to the thinking of Christ is what discipleship is all about. That's what we're seeking to do in discipleship. We respect culture because in Christ we receive a new adoptive culture, cultural heritage. Galatians 3.7 says, every believer, every person who has faith becomes the child of Abraham. And whether we like it or not, when we come to Christ... The whole heritage of Christ, the apostles, the prophets, the whole history of Israel becomes an adoptive heritage that we now share in. In New Zealand, if you're meeting with any of our Maori people, the first thing you do is you tell your whakapapa. You go through your genealogy. They love Matthew chapter 1. Several of my friends can recite it right off. Because they go through their whakapapa, they go through their genealogy and say who their father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, and they go back as many generations as they're able, and then they say, and, and they pick up in Matthew chapter 1, 
verse 1, and they go through to verse 18, and they say, that's my whakapapa, that's my inheritance as well, because they're in Christ, so they've got his heritage as their heritage. That's a very, very wonderful thing, uh, if you understand the importance of heritage, inheritance, and ancestors, which immediately cuts out most of the Westerners, but others, I think, will all know exactly what I mean, right? Yes. Yep. Thank you. It's an amazing reality because it actually helps in the contextualization process very, very importantly because not only when we come to contextualize the gospel into our own culture do we have other neighboring cultures to compare it with, but we have this whole heritage of biblical history and church history against which we can compare our contextualization as well. We are the richest of all people because of this huge depth of heritage which is ours now. I could go on a long time on that, but we better not. In Christ, each culture is therefore liberated for global impact and destiny. As Romans 15 said, each culture is invaded by Christ so he can turn it around so that they, the members of that culture, in turn can reach out to the next. And this is God's plan and purpose. Well, if we put those things together, I hope you will see what I mean when I say the distinctive thing about a Christian approach to culture is that we can accept and respect them because we realise God's intentions for cultures. But obviously, we have to say more than that. The second thing we need to say is that culture is an ever-present limiting factor in adequate contextualization, and I'm going to give you a number of reasons for that. First, because all cultures have been spoiled by human sin. I don't have to tell you that. You know how real it is. Um, I was going to go and flip through and have a look at Romans chapter 1 um, and trace the inevitable regress that comes when because people reject the known truth uh, about God, refuse to put God first and don't say thanks to him, a procession begins which um, leads to deluded minds and twisted values, to substitute gods, to perverted desires and bodies, to corrupt conduct generally in the society and ultimately to the place where we call bad good. In New Zealand we call homosexuals heroes. We have a hero parade in our sad city where the good has been totally reversed to become evil. We make out of those who disobey and disrespect God's pattern. We call them people to be stars, idols we even call them, and we have competitions around the world uh, to find out who the latest idol can be. We honour and exalt and glory in that which we should be ashamed of, blushing about and be apologising for. We turn it all upside down. And it's not just in the, those other cultures. This is not just a Westerner's assessment of some other culture. This is my assessment of my culture because I know Paul was right. But if you're not sure about it, have a look at chapter 2 of Romans where he then has a look at what happens to religious people who do the same and he says that God's standards for them are just the same. There's only one standard. We all need to hold the truth humbly. We all need to honour God, not self, always. And we need to do good gratefully because God has no favourites. We need to respond to the light we've received and it's right living, not religious knowledge, which counts. It's the reality of our religion, not the image of it that's will stand, in good, stand us in good stead before God on Judgment Day. And every one of us will be asked the one question when we stand before God. Have you obeyed the light you have? For some that light will only be the light of conscience. For some it will be the light of conscience and law. For some it will be a light conscience of conscience, law and gospel. So a greater level of responsibility. But the same question. What have you done with what you knew about God? And the sad response, as we all know, is that because God treats people equally, all are equally guilty. And that's your summary of Romans chapter 3, but you all know that. And that's what I'm summing up in the statement there. Um, culture is an ever-present limiting factor because all cultures have been spoiled by human sin. Thus the Christian view of cultures, then, if we put together what I've said so far, can be summed up like this. The Christian view of cultures gives both the highest and the lowest assessment of culture. Good contextualization attempts to be true to both the potentially great but only partially realized good and the awfully distorted and twisted characteristics present in every human culture. 
I want to say that strongly because some people assume that in contextualization we just ignore other people's sinful ways. We, never, we shouldn't, we can't, we mustn't. But we must also remember the potential for good. But culture imposes on us in the way we go about doing contextualization because our cultural presuppositions are so all pervasive that can, they can in fact determine all that we do when we are trying to contextualize. Um, our attitudes toward our own and the other culture we're preaching or speaking into, our historical perspective on their culture, our involvement in promotion of a cause, the role or function of our activities, our professional standing as we're sharing the gospel, our own personal perception of ourselves, all of those things skew the way in which we actually present the gospel message. And sometimes they, they do the skewing without us even realising it. We don't realise how much our own presuppositions are actually making us selective about how we present and explain the gospel. But always the gospel is being interpreted through the lens of our own cultural experience and our standing within, within our own culture. As we seek to pass on biblical truth across the cultural horizon of our own society, then we are liable to distort both the original intention of the scriptures and the responses of those we serve because of the way these usually unconscious, culturally determined attitudes govern our actions. Missionaries are funny because they are very quick to pick up the moment anybody in the, the new culture twists scripture. They'll see it immediately, it happens. But we're very blind to when we do the very same thing um, and, and, and we take no notice of it. But in good contextualization, the contextualizer is very conscious of how he or she can also be rereading the scriptural message through their own culture and distorting it in ways very similar to what the converts do when they first hear that message. So we need to be aware of the all-pervasiveness of our own cultural presuppositions. More than that, culture tends to narrow selectively where scripture broadens and diversifies in the process of contextualizing. Um, as Westerners, we are all, all assured about the vital importance of the propositional truth that Paul sets out so clearly in his letters. Clearly the New Testament letters are vital for understanding the gospel because we're Westerners. We've got that whole Greek heritage of logical thinking behind it, so it couldn't be any other way. But when it comes to allegory or to the Song of Solomon or to Ecclesiastes, we're not quite sure that they're really proper revelation, are they? Um, we're not nearly so comfortable with that. You know what I mean? And without realising it, our cultural preferences are actually sifting scripture and how we go about it. I'll never forget, I was completely stumped and had no answer when a student one day said, we just for the first time in class, we'd worked through some of the Proverbs and we're sampling some of the, the passage of, the, of Proverbs. And the first reaction one of the students had was, Mr Hitchin, why didn't our missionaries start with this book when they started to evangelise our people? If you'd started here, we would have all been listening and taking notice. We would have immediately known just what you're saying because our, our culture is full of Proverbs. And so many of them sound exactly like what you're seeing here in the Scriptures. Why don't you use Proverbs as your first step in evangelising? And I was completely thrilled. I had no clue where I'd start in Proverbs to, to, to share the Gospel. But it made a pretty powerful point. But then again, of course, there was a time, the first time I went down to the Sepik, that's the area in the north uh, of Papua New Guinea, the area where our Christian Brethren work started. And I was, I'd been at a beautiful um, local assembly meeting for a worship service on a Sunday, the only white skin in the congregation. And uh, the student had taken me there after the service was over. He said, well, how did you enjoy it? And I said, well, it was great. I could follow most of what the fellows who spoke in pidgin were saying. I said, but what about the fellow at the end? Why did he spoil it with that long sort of talk on agriculture? And, and he, he said to me, he said, what? You didn't understand what he was saying? Yeah. I said, yeah, I understood clearly. He said, don't forget to prune the coffee trees this week. Make sure you don't forget we've got to prune the coffee trees this week. He said, yeah, that's what he said. But didn't you understand what he meant? I said, well, 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 well tell me, because I don't know what he meant other than what he said. He said, but, but how could he make it any clearer? He was reminding everybody that next Sunday is our annual offering for, and he mentioned what it was, um, and we must make sure we don't come without the fruit in our hand for that offering. 
Now, he hadn't mentioned next Sunday. He hadn't mentioned any offering. He hadn't mentioned being ready for it. He simply told the parable. And only the dumb European couldn't understand it. <laughs> you get the point? I'm not happy with allegory. Um, a biography is okay, uh, but they're just too, it's too imprecise for my Western way of thinking. But that's because my culture tends to narrow what the scriptures broaden and make very much wider. I see what I'm missing there. The third thing we need to say about cultures, culture, all, cultures are always integral to grasping truth because we can never express truth in a purely supracultural form. We need to think about this because there are some folk who actually believe that there's such a thing as the biblical culture that you take and you present in another place in place of their culture. But no such thing actually exists. Um, you see, as soon as you or I try to express any aspect of God's truth for the sake of others, the moment I put it into words, my culture has taken over. Because the only words I can use are the words of the English language or talk prison. Um, but the moment I put any thought into words, I've used culture. I've used the thought forms, the language, the ideas which I was, have brought up with. And so every person who speaks the gospel speaks it through their cultural window and through their cultural perspective. There's no such thing as a gospel which is not enculturated. The idea that one, any one cultural group writes the universal theology is simply wrong. God's message always comes to us in the wrappings of a particular cultural form. There's no such thing as the biblical culture which we simply announce in, other, in another culture. There are the abiding seeds of the gospel message and the abiding revelation of God in Christ in the written scriptures which always have to be planted and nurtured in and through the processes of translation and contextualization using the languages, thought forms, habits, ideas and lifestyles of each local culture. The message always comes through a cultural form. Cross-cultural awareness and experience confirm and clarify truth. I've already hinted at that from what I was just saying from those Melanesian examples. Um, I think most of us in this room will, will agree that it isn't until we actually move cross-culturally that we often realise how limited our understanding of the scripture was. When I went to Papua New Guinea, let me just give a list of some of the ideas that took on totally new meaning simply because I'd crossed the cultural barrier. The involvement of unseen forces in everyday life and Christ's role as cosmic ruler and upholder of nature and spirit powers, I'd never thought about until I went to Papua New Guinea but the Bible is full of it. The ancestors' continuing involvement in tribal life and the continuity and interdependence between previous generations of believers and ourselves, I'd never given a thought to. When I went to Papua New Guinea and realised how much the living dead controlled what happened to the living living, and then I read the final paragraph of Hebrews chapter 11 and reread half of Hebrews 12, it's all there in the Bible. But I've never heard any European preach on the last verse of Hebrews 11 because it actually says that your faith and my faith depends on what happens to our ancestors um, in the future. Now that's a bit strange from my point of view, but all of my Melanesians understand it, friends all understand it perfectly clearly. It's only Europeans who don't understand the continuity of the, the ancestors with the present living experience. You've got to cross cultures to understand that. An understanding of time and the future quite different from Western ideas of history. We'll come back to that later in the week. The understanding of religion as the integrating factor of the whole of life, not just a one day a week ritual. Understanding personal value and righteousness in terms of one's value to the tribe and to maintaining tribal obligations rather than to me as an individual. Um, all of these things I could go on. Spiritual forces intervening directly in the natural world so that Secondary causes are not really important, only the, the primary spiritual ones count. All of these things were quite different to my European experience, but 
they actually opened ways to understand what was being spoken in the Bible much more clearly once I'd crossed the cultural barrier. Cross-cultural awareness and experience confirm and clarify truth. Contextualising across cultures on the flip side of that is it causes a boomerang effect for the missionary sending community. We see this happening in the story of what happened in the church at Antioch and the church in Jerusalem after Paul and Barnabas had had their first missionary journey to the Galatian churches. You remember the situation? Paul and Barnabas had gone and had all this amazing experience of the gospel being received by faith in new cultures. They come back to, to Antioch and there's a major um, conflict goes on, a major argument goes on because a group from Jerusalem have come down and said the only proper way to be Christians is to live the way we do it in Jerusalem. And Paul and Barnabas, uh, Peter and Barnabas had been following their way for, uh, had been following a different way, they'd been following the way they'd learnt in the Galatian missionary expedition um, for some time. But when these folk from Jerusalem come, they change their behaviour and Paul confronts them and you know the story. You see, going out and doing mission amongst other cultures, then coming back to your own culture brings all sorts of new ideas that the people in your own culture, in the sending culture, the original sending culture, have got to think through in new ways. And often they don't like it or want it. They're perfectly happy with the ways they've always understood the, the, the gospel. And Yet, it was the response that the churches in Antioch and Jerusalem made to that challenge from the frontiers of mission that determined whether or not they would continue to be a shining light for the next generation of gospel outreach. Jerusalem rejected that challenge. Antioch embraced it. Antioch became the new centre of the whole of the rest of the book of Acts and Jerusalem falls away. And the Western church today is in exactly the same situation. Unless we listen to the challenge coming back to us from our friends overseas, well then we are in danger of becoming um, a spent force in global evangelism. If we Western Christians fail to heed the questions asked and criticisms made of us by those on the new frontiers, questions about our affluence, our individualism, our rationalism, the scepticism with which we approach the Bible, the unbiblical confidence we place in nuclear families and so on, then our candle may be removed from its lampstand as happened to the Jerusalem church as it drew back from cross-cultural openness in the first century. And that's the challenge which has come through all the six major phases as the gospel has gone to different centres of cultures and the history of the church. The same challenge has come and as yet none of the previous cultural centres have actually responded in such a way that they've continued to be a force in global evangelism. So if history repeats itself, the Western Church has very little going for it. But if we heed the challenge, if we catch the boomerang, we need the Aussies for that, um, well then we can actually perhaps still be useful in the next generation of global outreach. Cultural diversity enriches contextualisation. Um, as I was just showing, it's only as you cross the cultural boundary that you gain fresh insights in scripture. When Paul prays for the Ephesians, he says, I pray that with all the saints you may know the height, the length, the breadth, the depth of the love of God. Because Paul knew that unless the Ephesian church listened to what the Colossians and the Galatians and the others, which what all the saints were saying about the love of God, that have only a sectional understanding of it. If we want to have a full understanding of all the breadth, length of the love of God, we need to listen to all the saints of God. But boy, that's hard. Well, that shouldn't be, because in our day, as we were hearing last night, all around the world we've got people enjoying experiencing it, but who controls the publishing? Who controls what's actually available for us to read and know about them? It all goes through the filter of Western editorial processes before we can get to it. And so we shut off the possibility of learning for so many of these other cultures because of our narrow ways of controlling communication processes. We need one another to grow to maturity in understanding even the most basic parts of our, of our gospel. Okay. We've tried to stress the importance of culture and I've stressed those because I think these are the areas that we need to clarify and think through 
in our brethren heritage particularly. But the second part of what I'm saying, we need to also at the same time uphold the biblical truth factors in contextualising. And we need to say um, a number of things quite clearly here. First is the obvious truth, but we need to repeat it, that God's truth is always greater than our best grasp of it. Since God is one and infinite, that's inevitable. Many of us actually think that the way we describe God and the way we put it into words, that's it, that's it, finish. We, we do it fully and completely. But our best grasp of the, of the knowledge of God, of any aspect of his nature, of any aspect of biblical truth, is only ever partial. It may be right, it usually is, but it's never ever the whole perspective. We need cross-cultural awareness for that. Um, if I had time, I could quick give you a beautiful quote from Henry Robert Reynolds, who was principal of a college that um, James Chalmers went from in 1865. Um, and Reynolds had the beautiful picture of everybody looking through the, the curtain of the Holy of Holies, as it were, through a little sort of a chink, a little hole in the curtain. And we all of us looking at the glory of God, and each one of us around that curtain all saw one little tiny part of it. We said, ah, God's so wonderful. This is what God's like. And we explained it with greatness and glory and excitement, as if it was the total. And in fact, it was only one little tiny perspective on it. We need to see each perspective. We need to be able to see the whole, which only the, the world view, if you like, of the, the, the whole global Christianity can give us. Um, not just that, God's truth, we want to stress this, is always many-sided. At first glance, the idea Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, may seem self-evidently an explanation of what Christ did at the, at the cross. But when you dig into the whole of the New Testament, you find that the scriptures themselves use a very wide range of terms to explain what was happening when Christ died for our sins. Just think of all these things. The language of the rich and the rituals of the temple of worship and the common human experience of animal sacrifice provided the background when his death is explained as the work of a high priest making an expiation or a propitiation. And those are one set of ideas to describe it. Human family relationships, the emotions and social yearnings for understanding, acceptance, belonging and trust, having trustworthy friends provide the background contributing to the explanation of Christ's death as the expression of the love of God. The com commercial language, the transactional experience of the marketplace lies behind the metaphor of Christ's death being a redemption. He died to buy us back. The interpersonal relationships, interpolitical relationships, battles and conflict, and our sense of shame and experiences of lapses in loyalty lie behind the reconciliation term used to describe the death of Christ. We go to the law courts and listen to the legal terminology explaining Christ's death when we speak about being justified before the just judge. Binding international treaties, human contracts and wills, concepts of loyalty to formal formally enacted political commitments will lie behind our description of Christ's death as initiating a new covenant. To get the point, all of those different ideas, temple ideas, commercial ideas, redemption, each of those different ideas are used and are necessary to understand the fullness of what Christ was doing at the cross. None of these explanations is adequate in itself. Each one is true according to the scriptures and what I've mentioned is only the beginning. The reality is so deep, wide and extensive, a range of explanatory metaphors are essential to make clear what Christ Jesus achieved through his death and resurrection. And if we had time, we could go and look at all the different ways sin is described metaphorically in the scripture. All the different images for the church as the bride of Christ, the branches on the vine, the people of God, the army of God, you know the, the rest. Every aspect of Biblical theology is described in the scriptures with a range of metaphors, never a single idea to make clear what it's all about. And that's very important. We need to grasp that when we are in the process of contextualizing the gospel into a local situation. The many-sided wisdom of God keeps the contextualizer humble when offering his or her best explanation 
of what the scripture means. And then, of course, the same thing is implied when we talk about the nature of truth as seed in Christ's own parables of the kingdom. He repeatedly likened the good news of the gospel as seed being sown in different kinds of soil. And we all know that different kinds of soil are necessary to bring out the full potential of the one kind of seed. And so it is culturally, we need a variety of cultures for the scriptures to be planted in to find the different range of ways in which they can blossom and flourish and bring other aspects of meaning to light simply because they are there from another perspective. The great cry of the reformers, the great cry of, of our progenitors at the beginning of the Brethren movement, God still has more light, fresh light to break forth from the scriptures. And that's a wonderful truth. Many people down the years have given their lives to preserve it. For evangelicals, this confidence in the scriptures as spirit breathes, plus our conviction of the abiding presence of the same active spirit, brings a creativity to our humility as we cross cultural divides holding forth the word of life. We can never know what the spirit may yet choose to bring out from this treasure store of his word. He always has more light to break forth from the scriptures. But then God's truth is also universally applicable and can be known in truth in every culture. Um, the Bible belongs and is translatable into every culture. And if we had time, we could ask um, the Suriname expert here to come and share his uh, PhD thesis on the topic. So I sort of speak with trembling here at this point. Um, <coughs> the significant thing is that this is what makes the Christian gospel different from Islam, for instance. Our gospel is translatable. It has to be to bring its message home fully and clearly to people. We don't have to have the sacred language to preserve its truth. Its truth is actually secure only as it is continually translated into other cultures. Um, because the Bible uses transcultural metaphors or word pictures for every key doctrine. I've just illustrated that from the atonement. We could go through all the other areas of uh, biblical teaching to confirm it in a range of ways. Um, some specific theological words or concepts may not be found in each culture, but the background of ideas or life experiences of the great majority of theological metaphors in the Bible are found universally. By using a range of transculturally meaningful metaphors to explain the many-sided truth of the facts of our salvation in the scriptures, God the Spirit has opened ways for us to contextualize these truths into local cultures by means of common human experiences to which the metaphors refer. We're going to come back to that in a moment. And then, of course, God's truth has been definitively incarnated in Christ. The distinctive, authoritative, definite features of human salvation have been set out in the scriptures, particularly in the uniqueness of Christ and the uniqueness of the gospel. Now, we could explain that fully, but I think it's self-evident. Our task becomes to recognise both the authority and the exemplary aspects of that apostolic teaching and to discern between the abiding principle and the way it has been expressed in a particular cultural form that we are free to reproduce in further cultural forms. So God's truth then, and these factors about God's truth, are the foundation, if you like, for our contextualisation. And to sum it up, the contextualization task essentially is working for an appropriate interplay between the two things I've been saying, between a proper understanding of culture and a holding together of this full nature of the biblical truth. That's what is being done in good contextualization. I want to say three or four things quite quickly, but very clearly, I hope. First, culture identifies the most relevant starting points for contextualizing biblical truth. Different aspects of truth suit different people as relevant starting points for encounter with Christ and understanding him. <clears throat> now just to stick with the the atonement examples we've been using, <clears throat> in some cultures, 
the justification metaphor is not immediately relevant because the legal systems under which they work don't parallel the biblical uh, uh, <coughs> background um, sufficiently to immediately to be able to latch on to what justification is all about. But in those same cultures, the background to reconciliation and the shame that goes with broken relationships is so deeply in, ingrained that the moment you talk about reconciliation, everybody knows what you're talking about. You get what I'm saying? So as a starting point for the gospel, in some cultures, justification might not be a good place to start, whereas reconciliation might be the ideal. In some places, the whole redemption metaphor of releasing people from the powers has got immediate relevance in a way that certainly temple language might not have. In other cultures, the whole concept of love might be so fresh, if it's explained biblically, as to really stir up a yearning and desire that people will gladly respond to, whereas judgment before a just judge is not where they're at if they're wanting to hear God's word as a starting point. Get what I'm saying? We need to learn to scratch where it itches culturally if we want people to be responsive and to hear as an evangelistic starting point. And we could go on and follow that through, and in the paper I do um, try to spell that out a bit. Um, we all know of <laughs> Wayne Dye's um, book on focusing on relevant sins. We all know about Don Richardson's Peace Child and the um, use of um, the analogies that he, the redemptive analogies that he referred to there. And I could challenge you, if you like, one question at the end. Which transcultural starting points in the scriptures and in your culture that you're working in would be the best place to start to explain the gospel for your people. I don't have to say, do I, that obviously the four spiritual laws don't immediately fit in all cultures all around the world, but you got that point without me saying it. Um, secondly, culture will determine the communication means and modes. We need to actually bring the gospel to people in ways that they know how to appreciate and understand it. Obviously, language is the first thing, but thought forms, patterns of speech, use of parables, use of allegorical language, all of these kind of things need to fit. The conceptual frameworks, how they actually, how their worldview fits, how they're thinking about time and about relationships and about obligations, where these fit, we need to make sure that the gospel is being presented in ways that fit within and, and uh, make sense within those frameworks. The culture would therefore determine the teaching and learning styles that we ad adopt as we begin the contextualization process. And then thirdly, from the culturally sensitive, the culturally relevant starting point that we've just spoken about, we must reach up to biblical fullness in contextualizing truth for mature believers. It's not enough just to stay where we begin. It's not enough to scratch where it itches and just talk about the one or two metaphors that fit in the local culture. If we want mature believers, we've got to fill that out in the discipleship program to make sure they come to understand the full range of things. Why do we have so many people in the West who as Christians have never got to grips with materialism? One of the reasons is that we've never stressed the idea of being pilgrims and followers. Not many people in the West want to hear that they haven't got a, a lasting home here and that they're on a journey where they don't need to carry anything in their bags and get on with it. No, 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 they're very comfortable, thanks, in their big flash home and they want to stay there. And we, 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 we let them have it. We never challenge that in our preaching. Why? We ignore the metaphor of followers and pilgrims to our peril and the result is we've got so many half-hearted Christians living in, in affluence and forgetting what they should be doing because we've neglected one aspect because people say, oh no, no, that's not relevant in our society at the moment. Well, if we don't preach it, they'll remain immature because we haven't preached it. You get the point I'm making? We find the culturally relevant starting point for evangelism, but we must fill out the full range of biblical explanations to get mature believers. And that's what the discipleship program is all about. It goes from the first initial uh, relevant starting point to increase or the ones that are not quite so relevant and we explain the relevance and we bring people to, to fill it out in their own personal experience. Now that's important because this broadening of understanding is essential to avoid unhealthy sy syncretism. 
When one aspect of biblical teaching is overused or treated as if it is all the Bible teaches on that topic, we can easily distort truth. The various metaphors given in scripture to fill out the meaning of central theological concepts all need to be considered and applied for believers to come to mature Christian lifestyles. A limited grasp of the fullness of scripture leads to immaturity of faith and life. Covering the biblical range of explanation for each central doctrine is necessary to correct possible misunderstandings or distortions of our new life in Christ. Every culture favours their own ethnocentric readings of the scriptures. Good contextualization guards against such syncretizing readings by striving to make the word of God fully known in the diversity of the full range of explanatory metaphors describing each aspect of truth. So effective contextualization then recognizes that at different stages of growth in the church, different aspects of one truth will need emphasis to ensure ongoing growth. Common problems such as legalism, seeking shortcuts to holiness, unwillingness to face the cost of discipleship, continue to challenge groups of Christians in every culture at different times. Different aspects of biblical insight bring answers to each of these problems. Thus, all of the scriptures are needed. Maturity in Christian behaviour and social involvement requires an in-depth grasp of a full range of biblical teachings on ethical issues and so on. You get the point I'm making? The last one, in-depth cultural transformation is the goal of any adequate contextualization. Being loyal to the scripture, but reaching to the point where the culture itself is turned around and seeks to reflect and follow the ways of Christ is the goal that we're working for. Biblical loyalty then becomes the measure of the validity and truth of the contextualization process within each culture. All right, what have we found? We've said that for effective contextualization, we need to grasp the cultural factors in contextualization. We need to uphold the biblical truth factors, and we need to work to hold them in the kind of balance that I've suggested comes when we get that process that we've just followed through. Namely, we start with the culturally relevant biblical truths, we ensure culture shapes the processes and concepts that we're talking about, we move on to the full range of biblical metaphors relating and applying them in the local culture, so as to ensure maturity and worldview level transformation. And by God's help, we'll try to give some examples of that in the scriptures tomorrow.